exercise. Not a hypocrite there. Exercise is life. But again, think about it. If you are feeling anxious and you go for a walk or a bike ride or a run or you go play tennis or you go do whatever is your exercise of choice, you're not feeling anxious during that exercise. And, and again, it's good for you physically, but it's also really good for you mentally because it cuts that communication between the brain and the body telling the brain it needs to be afraid. There have been a ton of studies that show that moderate physical exercise four times a day, four times a day, four times a week, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Um, that, was, that was what you call a Freudian slip, y'all. Um, yeah, four times a week is just as effective as an antidepressant in moderate depression. It makes complete sense if you stop and think about it, but rarely does a doctor tell you, if he thinks that you're depressed, that what you really need to do is go outdoors and take a walk for 30 minutes four times a week. Nutrition. So again, if you think about it, it makes sense. You've got chronic inflammation in your body because your brain is telling your body it needs to be ready to run away. Think about it, right? Your body's full of all this chronic inflammation and then you're adding more inflammation in the food that you're eating? Kids don't need Doritos. Kids don't need Big Red or Mountain Dew or Coke or Pepsi or any number of carbonated sugar sweetened beverages. And then you add the caffeine on top of it, right? So you've got, you've got the addictiveness of the sugar, you've got the addictiveness of the caffeine, you've got the rush of both of those, just exacerbating that feeling of being ready to jump at any moment. Those are all things that are really bad for kids and adults that have high ACE scores or have anxiety or are constantly feeling afraid. The other thing is mindfulness. So yoga, meditation. I saw some state somewhere, and it was down south, and it wasn't Texas, but they uh, banned the practice of yoga in schools. Dumbest thing I've ever heard, because it was religious. Tons of research has shown that just five minutes of meditation a day in the classroom improves kids' abilities to sit still, concentrate, and pay attention. My son is a fourth grade teacher. He does this with his kids. Makes a huge difference. And it's not religious. It's connecting the brain to the body. Same thing with yoga. Yoga is basically exercise and meditation together, right? So it's a win-win. So that's good for kids and adults. And then mental health, right? Yay, mental health providers. Sometimes kids need help processing the trauma that they've experienced. Sometimes adults need help processing the trauma that they've experienced. They need a professional to help them figure out how to get from where they are to where they want to be. And that's completely appropriate. If you have strep throat, you go to the doctor and you say, here's where I am. My throat hurts. I don't want it to. The doctor says, here's what you do. You do it. You feel better. You go to a mental health provider. I feel scared all the time. I don't want to. Mental health provider says, all right, here's what we're going to do. You need to do this, this, and this, and I'll help you. And when we'll get to the other side, and you won't feel scared all the time, and you, that'll be good. I don't know how we've gotten to the point where we've, we've created this culture where it's OK to go to the doctor if you've got something wrong with your body, but it's not OK to go to the doctor if you've got something that's not quite the way you want it to be in your, in your head. 
It doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, so there's the list of how you create resilience, both in kids and adults. Because again, even at age 70, it is possible, or 80 or 90. I keep moving that up the older I get, right? 70 doesn't seem quite so old anymore. Even at age 100, um, <laughs> you, can, you can train your brain to um, think differently and be wired differently. So what are we doing here in San Antonio? We are doing something super excited, exciting. It's called the Trauma-Informed Care Consortium. This consortium started less than a year ago. And we, I need to update this slide. We now have over 300 people who are part of the consortium. And we now have 12 different sectors. Um, we decided actually last month that we needed a, a new sector that focuses on higher education. So when I say sectors, we had a group of about 50 people come together um, in a room for like four hours, and we mapped out every potential possibility where an organization or a group of organizations would come in contact with kids. And then we created now 12 sectors where we would group all of those organizations. So for example, there's a medical sector because kids go to the doctor. There's a uh, early care and education sector because a lot of kids go to childcare before they go to school. There's a kindergarten through 12th grade sector. Now there's a higher education sector. Um, there's also a faith-based sector there is a sector that focuses on family support services. Um, I'm not going to be able to name all 12. Y'all don't need to know all 12. But there's 12 different areas where we are focusing on how can we implement trauma-informed care. And every month, these sectors are meeting and talking about how they can help all of the organizations inside their sector implement trauma-informed care. I am super excited because it was only like six months ago I started talking about my secret. And my secret was this, and I wanted to keep it a secret from Austin because I wanted us to get there before they did. <laughs> we are going to establish a trauma-informed care certification entity in San Antonio. It will be the first one in Texas. Thank you very much, Austin. <laughs> and it is being developed in such a way that the first five years, it's going to focus on San Antonio. And it's going to have subsidized funding from the city, from the county, from private foundations, so that any organization in San Antonio and Bear County that wants to become certified in trauma-informed care can do so at a much less expensive rate than if they did it um, without this Texas San Antonio-based group. Um, there are a couple organizations in San Antonio that are certified in trauma-informed care. They had to get a consultant out of Washington, D.C. Um, and they had to pay that consultant like $30,000 in order to do this. That's not how it's going to work here. It's going to be affordable. It's going to be culturally appropriate to South Texas. And it's going to be the norm. If you are an organization that works with kids, you're going to be certified in trauma-informed care because all of the major funders, that's another one of our sectors, is philanthropy. All of the major funders in San Antonio are part of this consortium because they want to make sure that they're funding what works. So super psyched. There's money in the city's budget this year. It hasn't passed yet, but the money is there to start this effective October 1st. I know. I know. So we're going to go from this consortium that didn't exist a year ago to now having 
a trauma-informed care certification entity in Bear County. Super excited about that. This entity, in addition to providing certification, will also provide technical assistance to organizations uh, around trauma-informed care and will also provide training to the general public. We have had such a tremendous outpouring of interest in individuals wanting to know what they can do. And there are some things they can do, and so we're gonna be sharing that with them as well. So um, that goal has become nearly a reality. We can now, I think, talk about it in Austin. I think it's okay, I think we're far enough ahead that we're gonna win. Um, but the cool thing about the certification entity is that it will, it will become self-sufficient after five years because it will charge probably not 30000 but maybe $20,000 to folks from Dallas and Fort Worth and Houston because they can afford it, right? Um, and then that will subsidize the work that continues on throughout um, Bear County. So it's a really cool model. I'm super excited about it. Um, all right, so I want to show you all my favorite video. It's just a four-minute video um, because I think it's a really great resource to share with parents and other kind of non-mental health professionals because it talks about all of this in a, in a really compelling way for people who aren't experts. <music> Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, 
and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. So the link to that is in the handout, which I believe you can access via the web or the app or the conference link, whatever. I don't know how y'all are doing it electronically, but that's available to you electronically, as are the slides from today. So um, there are also additional resources for you that we have compiled together. Um, ACEs and trauma-informed care is something you're gonna be hearing a lot more about. Um, so I imagine that there will be more resources out there available to you. And once our certification entity is up and running, that'll be a warehouse for all of them. Um, but it, it, is, it is astounding to me as somebody who's been talking about ACEs and trauma-informed care for two decades, how much attention is being focused on it over the last two years. Um, so I, I'm super excited. They're, they talked about it in, in um, the Texas legislature this year. We, we had a couple bills that had trauma-informed care components to them that did get passed. We had one big one that didn't quite make it this time, but it'll make it next time. Um, and they're talking about it in Washington, D.C. as well. So I'm excited about the, the realization that we need to start focusing there. <laughs> 